Hello folks, we're in the last four chapters of The Cure of Souls, the recovery of the, recovering the, oh what is that, recovering the, um, where, there I am, recovering the doctrine of biblical confession. And yeah, so let's hit the record button and make a start. 46. The Indulgence Society. It is commonly believed that the system of It is commonly believed that the system of indulgences is an institution limited to the Roman Catholic Church. It is my purpose, as should now be apparent, to show that it is commonly found in all the churches and is very much the policy of the modern state. As we have seen, the states in the Christian era borrowed the doctrine from the church. Our modern pardoners or peddlers of indulgences are judges, juries, parole boards, governors and presidents. Let us examine first the Roman Catholic doctrine as briefly stated in The Grounds of Catholic Doctrine. It is a releasing by the power of the keys committed to the church, the debt of temporal punishment which may remain due upon account of our sins after the sins themselves as to the guilt and punishment have been already remitted by repentance and confession. End quote. This is a careful statement which avoids reference to the actual practices attacked by Martin Luther but sanctioned by the papacy. The morally licentious John Tetzel sold indulgences which declared, May our Lord Jesus Christ have mercy upon thee and absolve thee by the merits of his most holy passion, and I, by his authority, that of his, that of his apostles, and I, by his authority, that of his apostles Peter and Paul, and of the most holy Pope, granted and committed to me in these parts to absolve thee first from all ecclesiastical censures in whatever manner they have been incurred, then from all thy sins, transgressions and excesses, how enormous soever they may be, even from such as are reserved from the cognizance of the Holy See and as far as the keys of the Holy Church extend, I remit to thee all punishments which thy deserves in purgatory on their accounts and I restore thee to the holy sacraments of the Church, to the unity of the faithful, and to that innocence and purity which thou possessest at baptism, so that when thou diest the gates of punishment shall be shut, and the gates of the paradise of delight shall be opened. And if thou shalt not die at present, this grace shall remain in full force when thou art at the point of death. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Council of Trent affirmed the theological validity of indulgences while curbing their practice. Their seal, however, did continue in some areas at least until 1800. In our time, Cardinal Ratzinger has affirmed the validity of the doctrine. The fallacy in this doctrine and practice is that what should be reserved to God and his law is usurped by the Church instead of repentance and restitution, a moral change, a financial transaction takes place. The subject is one of embarrassment to Catholics, but a delight to Protestants and humanists in criticising the Roman Catholic Church. Certainly it must be criticised and condemned, but we must be careful that we are not guilty of the same sin before we could cast a stone. <laughs> We must be careful that we are not guilty of the same sin before we cast a stone. John 8, 7 We are commanded by our Lord to judge righteous judgment. John seven twenty four, which means judging according to God's justice or law. There is no relationship between indulgences and God's law. We are, however, forbidden to judge, first on purely personal grounds, that is, out of trifling reasons and dislikes, or second, when we ourselves are guilty of the same 
or worse offences? John 8, 1-11 We are told, Judge not, that ye be not judged, for with what measure ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Matthew 7, 1-5 Now let us consider some instances of Protestant indulgences. First, a young businessman, his company of a few years, history. Company, history. His company of a few years, history, flourishing, hired as an accountant, a church member. Before long, he found himself near bankruptcy. The accountant had stolen approximately $450,000 to invest in schemes he felt would enrich him greatly, and had lost it all. In the process, he had given generously to the church. The church called the businessman's demands for restitution harsh and unforgiving. As a Christian, he should forgive his erring brother, who had neither repented nor asked for forgiveness. An investigation by the businessman turned up the embarrassing fact that the thief had done the same thing in three other cities, only to be forgiven by the church. This discovery only enraged the church leaders all the more, and the businessman was censured as unchristian. Several like instances involving sums of money, great and small, could be cited. In fact, all too many cases. Second, again, a too common instance. A man or a woman is guilty of adultery. In many cases, habitually so. If the guilty party cries or acts contrite, the innocent spouse is ordered to take them back. If the innocent party objects that there is no repentance, no evidence of abandoning also either alcoholism or drugs and no clean bill of health with respect to venereal diseases or AIDS, the church authorities denounce this because it supposedly introduces materials extraneous to the spirit of forgiveness in Jesus. In these and countless other kinds of incidents that occur daily, God's law is despised by the Protestant doctrine of indulgences. Now, I've got to hit that. Hit it, Pippo! God's law is despised by the Protestant doctrine of indulgences. Forgiveness can only be in terms of God's law as a satisfaction of his justice. The modern state, too, has its indulgences, fines, prison sentences, and so many hours or months of community services. Services. So many hours or months of community services. An unrepentant and particularly vicious rapist out in patrol. <laughs> All right, let's uh, make. Make some noise! An unrepentant and particularly vicious rapist out in patrol. Not patrol, parole. An unrepentant and particularly vicious rapist out in parole express anger at the protest, protest, post-test, protest with the most test. Expressed anger at the protest of many. I've paid my debt to society, was his statement. First, his debt was not to society but to God, whose law he had broken and he deserved to die. Second, there was no moral change in the man, neither repentance, confession, nor restitution. He had spent time in prison. He was involved there in homosexuality. 
he had practised the routines needed to impress a parole board, a collection of modern pardoners and indulgent peddlers, and within a year after his release he was arrested for another serious crime. How many had he committed which remained as unsolved crimes, no one knows. Our modern legal system is far worse than John Tetzel and his associates, and yet one and all accept it as justice. Someone has said, someone has said... Someone has said, when people have to worry about being protected from the legal... Sorry, I'm just... Maybe just uh, maybe just do something here. Link more. I mean, that's it. That's, that's the ticket. Protected from our legal system rather than being protected by it, it's time to do something. Well, during most of history, the state and its legal system have been as much an enemy to the people as criminals, sometimes more so. Just... Ah, uh, no, no, no. Tell me I'm not... I'm not recording. Unbelievable. Protected from our legal system, rather than being protected by it, it's time to do something. Well, during most of history, the state and its legal system have been as much an enemy to the people as criminals, sometimes more so. Justice will escape every legal system. Every church and state, if God's law is set aside, we will then have exactly what we do have, a system of indulgences. When the black prize fighter Mike Tyson savagely raped a young woman, a black, and a Sunday school teacher, a number of black pastors called for mercy for Tyson, community service and the like. White pastors too often kept silent, lest they be accused of that great modern sin, Racism. The indulgence society of the early 1400s was seemingly very powerful and the peddling of indulgences highly profitable and successful. It was, however, both evil and vulnerable. So too today, churches and states, following their self-hallowed indulgence systems, are highly vulnerable and will either be reformed or decay we live in an indulgent. We live. We live in an indulgent society, and are too blind to see it. Why don't you? Confession? Nope. 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 Let's try this. 2. 47. Confession and Inquisition. God requires confession, both a confession of sin and sins, and a confession of faith. Confession is thus, in a double sense, an important aspect of the Christian life, a mandatory one. The important question, however, is this. Can the state or church require it? First, in biblical law, there is no permission for the civil order to require confession. In Joshua 7, the sin of Achan led to Israel's defeat. God then supernaturally made it clear that Achan was the guilty man, together with his family. Joshua then said, Unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Joshua 7.19 Achan was asked to give honour to God, whose supernatural action had uncovered Achan's guilt, because sin uncovered and judged is less fearful than sin covered and unjudged. However, even though God himself had uncovered Achan's sin, and Achan confessed. So. A 
and Aiken confessed. Civil legality still required in terms of God's law corroboration. This was found and Aiken and his family were executed. It is evidence of how far Judaism strayed from the faith that Rashi held that Aiken was executed because he had violated the Sabbath. Two witnesses, or two forms of witness, were required. Numbers 35.30, Deuteronomy 17.6, 19, 15 and 16, etc. God nowhere empowers man to seek confession in civil matters, although he on occasion can himself confront men with their guilt. Second, in the church, again, two or more witnesses are required. Thus, in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, our Lord declares, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Paul declares with regard to sinners in the Corinthian church, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 2 Corinthians 13.1 Again, with respect to accusation within the church, Paul writes, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5.19 This is a telling statement because St. Paul here forbids even hearing charges let alone trying them, unless there are two or three witnesses to the charges made. There is another reference to this matter of the witnesses necessary for civil conviction in Hebrews 10.28, so that the law of witnesses obviously applied to church and state. Confessions were not alone valid, nor could they be extracted from any man. Roman law favoured forced confessions, as did all pagan laws. The church in its developments within Rome disentangled itself from the compulsory confessional system of the empire. Its requirement was rather... Its requirement... Its requirements was rather that men, led of God, confessed their sins and made restitution... It was thus a moral requirement in the main. The issue is a very, very important one. Mandatory confession in either church or state leads always to torture. Robert Held in Inquisition, 1985, called attention to the fact that the incredibly... called attention to the fact that the incredibly evil instruments of torture used in inquisitions are still used by many modern states in various continents. He cited three ecclesiastical inquisitions. One, the medieval or papal one against primarily the Helpigensians, but also used elsewhere. Circa 1231 to... circa 1231, 1400. 2. The Roman Inquisition for the Suppression of Protestantism, established in 1542 by Pope Paul III. And 3. The Spanish Inquisition, used by the Crown to centralise its power. Can we call it an accident in history that auricular confession was made mandatory at least once a year before communion by the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, and that in 1215 that same council made the persecution of heretics the business of synodical courts. In 1148, the Inquisition began its work against the Albigensians in southern France. Consider the implications of mandatory confession. It requires implicitly a confession not only of sin, but also of faith. Faith as the Church defines it. 
This gives enormous powers to the church. It compels the faithful to make a double confession. If the church can compel confession, it can logically also compel an undeviating, unswerving obedience to the church's confession of faith. This then vindicates an inquisition. The same is true in the state. The U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendment was intended to prohibit all coerced confessions. No man could be compelled to... No man could be compelled to testify against himself. This is precisely the amber <clears throat> Wimbley. This, however, is precisely what Congress compels witnesses to do, pretending to grant them immunity from pre- pretending to grant them immunity from prosecution. This immunity is rapidly eroding. Even the idea of compulsory self-incrimination, with or without immunity, is ungodly. The question of the relationship of confession and inquisition is an essential one. Confession is a spiritual necessity before God and, on occasion, before men. But to coerce men into confessing is the essence of all civil and ecclesiastical inquisitions. Inquisitions by civil governments are now commonplace in every continent, and their prevalence goes largely unnoticed. One of the great evils of all forms of inquisition is that they are justified in the name of protecting society, or, at one time, the church. True prosecution is a moral fact. True protection is a moral fact rather than a resort to... I'm sorry, this is just proving difficult for whatever reason. Is a moral fact rather than a resort to torture? Pastors and teachers are the necessary line of defence, but, above all, godly families. What we have seen thus far is that confession is a moral necessity. Confession can be made to the church or the clergy. It can be made to the person offended. Depending on the context, one or another of these can be morally required, but they cannot be coerced. It is a great evil to assume that, because a particular goal is good, any means to it partakes of that good. In fact, evil means create evil ends. Churches have suffered for their failures here. Psychotherapy is more and more discredited, and the power states is committing suicide. The link between confession and inquisition must be broken morally, legally, and in practice, the world is moving into ahead here. The world is moving into terrorism because its premises are very agreeable to it, civilly and ecclesiastically. Terrorism justifies itself by pointing to the ostensible evils of its targets. This has been the justification of tyrants over the centuries. It is particularly reprehensible that the Church has involved itself in this justification. The decline of religious confessions is both very sad and yet very necessary. The connection with the evil abuses of the concept over the centuries needs to be broken Oh, right, sorry for making that such an ordeal, folks. Hopefully with a cup of tea, um, I'll be, I'll be right as rain.
when I come back. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you find that useful. If you believe it, that this is a, a useful project, a project that'll help bring the light of God's holy word to issues of the day in a way that's uh, strategic and uh, so on, then do consider giving, giving a like, giving a share, giving a comment, and um, what else? Yeah, if you want to support the financially, uh, work financially to help me do more better work, for instance, and in renovating the booth, um, I have a piece of equipment coming from Germany to hopefully clear out the... That's happening. Basically, uh, uh, to help finance training, to help me do more better, more better work. Then uh, you can go to nathanteacher.com and click on donations. That would be much appreciated. Thanks and hope to see you soon.